to begin at the beginning, what was your family like? Was it a family of intellectual interests? Uh, I wouldn't say that. But my uh, my father was an electrical engineer, so there was a certain amount of some some form of mathematics in the background. My oldest son is also an engineer, so and my uh, older brother is an engineer. So. So you're the outlier, but still within that universe, yes, that yes. broader universe. Um, were your parents ambitious for you, or did they pretty much leave you be to your interests? Oh, I think they probably were ambitious for me. I, I, I know they uh, worked hard to get me in school too early so that I was uh, never very well socially adjusted to my classmates. But... Uh, was that a part, a question of being younger than they are? or yes, younger. Or younger, I see, I see. So in the school you were in, and let us really speak sort of at the high school level. Yes. Um, was it a good school, one with a lot of good teachers and possibilities? Well, I think it was a, a quite good school, yes. I, uh, but I, I, I was never very happy. In, in school, uh, I, 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 it was a, a different world when I came to Princeton as a fairly young undergraduate and uh, quickly made myself at home in the mathematics department there. It was just a first time I'd been with so many people I could relate to. But even before that, I'm still wondering when the curiosity about mathematics begins. Well, Is as it I said, my father was an engineer, so there were a few mathematical textbooks in the library. <clears throat> I remember uh, studying one, which was on, uh, on calculus. And there was also a rather obscure uh, translation from the German. I, I, don't, I can't remember the author, but it was on complex function theory. and found it very mysterious and amazing. Uh, so, but, uh, when you decided to go to Princeton, yes. did it, was it in part because Princeton had a rather rich academic environment in this subject, or you weren't even sure yet what you would oh, be I, interested in? I had no idea what I would be interested in, but it was, uh, it was close and, uh, seemed like a, a good choice. You know, sometimes one can phrase it this way, that you found mathematics or mathematics found you, but how did you finally come, that, come to find that comfortable social but mostly intellectual environment? Well, I, I was interested in many things, but somehow mathematics seemed much easier. <laughs> For example, I, I I, I, I fancied myself a poet, and when I took, I took an English course, the, uh, the pref professor gave my poem as a horrible example of what not to do. <laughs> so this was a negative yes. push. And uh, I was also interested in physics, but somehow I had two left hands when it come, came to the laboratory experiments, and just mathematics seemed easier and more natural to me. Uh. Which, by the way, was a pretty good instinct. Yes. It turned out to be exactly so. Mm -hmm. So describe that common room and, if you will, the social beginnings of being a mathematician. Uh, the, the end of loneliness was one thing you've said. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, people would gather there and... Uh, yes, yes. Somebody would pose a problem and another would solve... I mean, I, Well, there, I, were, there were many things. They, they, there were certainly discussions of mathematics. There was a lot of game playing. Uh, game theory was a big topic in Princeton in those days. So I, uh, it was just a, a general atmosphere in which you could talk with people and learn something and relax. One of the things that looks so interesting for those of us outside in other academic fields is how young you can be to begin to make a contribution in mathematics. Yes. In history, it takes quite a while. 
Um, you were quite young when you began to address questions that were noticed. How young were you when you were already, in a way, contributing to the discourse? Well, let's see, I suppose I, suppose I was a freshman, uh, so I must have been... That would make you 18, 19, something like that? Uh, perhaps 17, I'm not sure. Even 17? I, I, I would have to... Yeah, well, it's yeah. not precise, but yes. very young. Very young, yes. Very early in your college career, very yes. early in mathematics. What had you begun to do that was getting notice? Um, well, there was a, uh, a problem, a, an unsolved problem that the uh, Professor Tucker had described in a differential geometry class. And, I thought about it and was able to work out an answer. That was the, the first thing that happened. But you you got published, or what, did you get an award? I mean, because this was... It, it was eventually published, yes. It was eventually published. So, I mean, a year or so later, yes. Again, to pursue maybe the unanswerable question of, of youth and mathematical achievement, um, why do you think it is that somebody so fresh to the subject and so forth can begin to really participate in sophisticated discourse. Is there something in the nature of mathematics that is not age restrictive or the, the way you proceed? Well, I mean, the, the popular belief that it is age restricted in the, in the opposite sense, that it's hard for old people to contribute. Ah, ah. Well, why would that assumption be? I mean, again... Well, it's just a matter of history that there have been many young mathematicians and usually it's fairly rare that older mathematicians make a real contribution. I see. One, one of your colleagues said to me at one point uh, that it, he actually thought it was naivete, uh, by which he meant that there were no assumptions to get in your way. Mm -hmm. Well, there are parts of mathematics which have very heavy baggage. You have to learn an awful lot before you can begin. But there are other areas which you can, which you can start fairly fresh. So, who is noticing you in the faculty at this point? And I'm really speaking of mentoring and yes. inspiration. Well, uh, I, Ralph Fox, I guess, was the one I worked with most. But there were there were many people that uh, made an impression on me. So right, he was my thesis advisor. Uh, Solomon Lefschetz was still around then. He was, he was Fox's advisor and an uh, amazing old gentleman. He'd uh, lost both hands in an industrial accident. So he had, uh, really? Yes. So he had sort of leather hands that could s stick a pencil in to write, but it was... Uh, Extraordinary. And would you, would you say that um, most of your education happened uh, at that point in your, in your life in groups or I won't call it a lonely process, but more individually you and a professor? How, how are ideas being formulated in your education? Well, there were certain, classes were certainly important. Uh, was, this was uh, <clears throat> a period shortly after the war where a number of the professors had been, were uh, refugees from Europe. It was sometimes referred to as the Department of Broken English. <laughs> so their, so their English may not have been good, but certainly their mathematical skills yes, were spectacular. Yes. yes. So it was, uh, well, it was an amazingly diverse group. I'd been in a very homogeneous society up to then. And it was eye-opening to see people with so many different backgrounds. Is, you know, one can speak of the social loneliness or companionability of, of uh, mathematics, but as far as the ability to proceed and making a contribution, is it necessary to have a community around you? Is that one of the ways that thinking happens? Uh, well, mathematicians are different. They're, 
Okay. There, are, there are certainly cases of people who worked almost completely by themselves and made amazing contributions. Uh, well, I mean, there, to give some recent examples, mm -hmm. there was Perelman in Russia, there was Andrew Wiles, who worked almost completely by themselves. And at Princeton at that time, the example was Christos Papakirikopoulos, who's a Greek mathematician who had very little contact with anyone else. Hmm. Fox had arranged some sort of stipend for him so, so that he could live uh, adequately. And uh, I was there at the same time and hardly knew him. He didn't communicate hmm. much, but he, he, he made some amazing contributions. But your work was, I won't call it social, but very much in the community of ideas that you were encountering and yes, that's true. inspiring and being inspired. Yes, yes. Um, can you mention some of the pe people who intrigued you as either colleagues or teachers at this point? Well, I've mentioned Albert Tucker, who was, who was a rather ponderous, spoke very slowly, but uh, he was certainly an influence. He, he was particularly interested in game theory, and I was involved in game theory for a few years at that time. Uh, Ralph Fox was the my advisor, the one I was closest to. Mm -hmm. uh, he gave a course in topology using the uh, Moore method of teaching, which involves giving a list of theorems to prove and definitions and making the students do the work, do all, do all the work. And that was wonderful for me. So I, I, I got that, that's really what, uh, what focused me on topology in my first years. I'm also very interested, and you've spoken of this before, of the approach of different minds within mathematics, sort of yes. either habits or styles or yes. comfortable. So I know that there's an algebraic yes. mentality, if you will. Was that the kind you had? Not especially, no. Well, and speaking of algebra, Emil mm. Artin was, was a very charismatic figure that uh. I was certainly very impressed by. But, he had a completely different style. When Fox lectured, he was rather clumsy and often made mistakes, and uh, one learned a lot nonetheless. <laughs> Artin gave totally polished lectures. Every word was precise and thought out, and I attended an entire lecture for a year on algebraic number theory, and. He never actually mentioned algebraic numbers, as far as I can remember. I didn't learn till later what an algebraic number was. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but he was wonderful, also. What are you discovering about yourself and your mind, in terms of the direction you're most comfortable? Obviously, mathematics as a framework is very comfortable, yes. but a way of proceeding. Um, well. My personal way of proceeding is just to uh, think of some problem and concentrate on it. I'm not very good at having a vision of where things are going. But, uh, I just like either to concentrate on solving a problem or concentrate on understanding someone else's work. So I've written a number of books. Uh, explaining different theories, uh, often just from the point of view of trying to understand what other people were saying and working it out more clearly. And are you, it's a funny word to use, permitted to go where you want to go, both as a student and in mathematics, they basically trust once they know that you can do it, uh, they'll just let you, so to speak, support thinking in wherever you want to go? That's certainly been my experience. I, I don't remember any pressure to do one thing or another. I, in the rest of academia, there's a, an old cliche, which is unfortunately very true about publish or perish. Yes. Uh, in mathematics, well, what form does that take? Well, it's very true. It's, it 
it's uh, it's very hard on young people who have to have to produce, and uh, well, it's hard at any age. So there there is. It's not so much the mathematicians that enforce this as the uh, just the universities that uh, assume that publication is the criterion of, of, of so doing math something. Mathematicians are not off the hook in that. I have oh, sometimes an idea that as long as they know that you're going somewhere, uh, they'll just let you go and, and wait until something emerges. Well, this this is certainly true to some extent, but uh, if you want to be promoted or to uh, to uh, have a larger salary, it's it's yeah, important. It's, to fair enough. It's a career yes. as well as a, an intellectual excitement. Yes. Um, Again, on the question of characterizing broadly mathematical approaches, mm -hmm. um, one of the most obvious ones within and outside the field is the question of whether one would be described as a pure mathematician or an applied mathematician. Yes. Um, can you give me a sense of which you thought you were or going to be and really what that distinction means? Well, I'm certainly primarily a pure mathematician, but. Uh, you know, if there happen to be applications, that's wonderful. Now, well, I was involved with game theory for some years, and there, uh, there the applications were sort of evident. But they were incidental. Well, no. To your they, interest, no. Well, no. They, they, Well, the, the object was to solve something of practical interest, whereas often, often in mathematics, it's a, it's a pure matter of intellectual curiosity, understanding the way the, the, way the uh, world of mathematics should be organized or is organized. But is, is, is there a snobbery associated with the two approaches? I mean, there's some, some notion of pure mathematics um, being a higher pursuit I'm sure there are many pure mathematicians who feel that way. Uh, there's also a difference in the in the way things operate. Uh, applied mathematics, one really is one has has to produce useful applications. The, the funding comes from pre uh, specific problems, so it's much more. The goals are given to you rather than you being able to select them. But there's, I mean, there's always been a, a big interchange between pure and applied mathematics, and also between mathematics and mathematical physics. That there, these interchanges always enrich both subjects. And did the environments in which you found yourself, academic environments, encourage those interchanges? Well, no. I think there was a lot of tension between the pure and applied mathematicians, and there, there often is. But, I mean, one ex one example of the uh, effect, one of the most amazing applied mathematicians was Claude Shannon at Bell Laboratories. He was concerned with mathematical questions, which were directly concerned with communication what later became computer technology and mm. so on, and yet his, his ideas also transformed mathematics that became very important as a part of pure mathematics. Uh, and the interaction between mathematics and theoretical physics is, is, has always been amazing. But, uh, ideas which arose in one become very important in the other. It goes in both directions, so it's people who can operate in both fields have that. Which is the ideal intellectual context for really yes. anything. Yes, yes. As I continue to try to understand approaches within mathematics broadly, um, I remember reading about you that you said that your approach had a lot of visualization. That's true. And it, can you explain that to me as a way of both thinking and transmitting ideas? Well. I think just different minds work differently. Uh, I tend to be happier when I can see pictures. I, I enjoy working in fields where pictures play an important role. 
and I, I have a lot of difficulty in, say, uh, understanding someone when they're just talking and not, not, I don't see anything written down. So I, it's just my eyes are more important to me than my ears. Ah, well said. But, but uh, I mean, that's my peculiarity. It's not, not typical. Oh yes, I, I know it doesn't have to be one way or the other, but yes. it is you I'm interested in. Yes. So now visualization, both in terms of how it is really means, I think, in mathematics, uh, literally the writing down the symbolic language that you use. I mean, is that well? That's that's certainly important, and well, we often have to work in higher dimensions, so it's a question of what visualization really means when you're talking about four-dimensional space, but... Uh, well, what does it mean when you're well, talking? Well, it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> but it still is, in a way, the habit of how your mind will take it in. Yes, yes. I um, spoke to one mathematician who said, until I can write it down, mm -hmm. which is also a kind of transmission yes. to the specific, I don't think I really understand it. Yes, well, I agree with that because it's uh, it's very easy to have vague ideas and think you understand something, and then when you actually out try to write down the details, you find you're assuming something which is not so obvious. It, uh, so you have to have to check all of the details to be sure you understand what is going on. I think you've been often complimented on the lucidity of your presentation of information, uh, which is probably not inevitable among all mathematicians. Is it part of this process that you're describing? Yes. Well, it's uh, it's when I have trouble understanding something, then I have to try to write it out clearly, and uh, if I can really make write it out so that I understand it, there's a much better chance that somebody else will understand it. Right. So you're your toughest editor, so to speak. I, I rewrite a great deal, yes. I, I used to drive secretaries crazy. I, I would handwrite a manuscript and they would type it up beautifully and then I would change this and this and paste this and that and they'd have to start over again. And the poor ladies were had a hard time. <laughs> it was wonderful when computers made it possible to avoid this. Any other profound implication of the application of computerization to solving mathematical problems? That Well, I make a great deal of use of computers, but in a, in a very limited sense. I don't, I don't use very fancy techniques or high-speed computers, just things, but just being able to make computations which are easy now and which would have been a nightmare 30 years ago it makes you can, you can see what you're talking about and, and see what uh, things are reasonable to prove and what things turn out to be nonsense mm. and I think one of the characteristics of your achievement if I'm right and I really ask you if I am is that you found assumptions not to be valid, or that you 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 would um, assume something because everyone did, but then you would take it somewhere else and find out that it was wrong. Well, I think I think mathematicians are very very well aware of the difference between something which is known and something which is unknown. Uh, they make guesses as to what the true state of affairs is, but. Uh, well, I was involved in this, I guess, particularly in the question of differentiable structures on manifolds, mm -hmm. where it was more or less assumed by most people that if a manifold had a differentiable structure, it was, it was unique. But certainly the people were aware that this was just a, a guess, that it hadn't been proved. And I certainly wasn't expecting to disprove it. I was just studying some examples and arriving at a contradiction which I couldn't understand. I studied the same example from two different points of view and got different answers. 
and eventually the only way to resolve the problem was to realize that uh, I had two manifolds which were topologically the same but differentially different. But this was certainly not a conscious effort on my, my part to solve the problem. It was just, I was just pushing ahead a little bit at a time trying to understand a class of objects and uh, it turned out to be more complicated than I expected. You um, are beginning to develop a rather good career in mathematics. Um, how do you decide where to locate? I think really so much of your work was done at Princeton. Yes. So um, you did graduate work there as well as undergraduate and then stayed on the faculty. Yes. How um, difficult a career decision is that? Is that natural? Are you challenged by other places or you decide you've got a good thing going? Well, Why did you no, stay I, at Princeton? Well, it was really just for family reasons. But, uh, oh. but my wife was at Stony Brook and I, I think we were all right commuting back and forth until our son got old enough to talk and began to complain about it. <laughs> so it, it seemed better to locate in one place. Women in mathematics in general, when yes. you were a, a, a young man at Princeton, yes. um, were there women mathematicians around in the community or was this a difficult place for them to be? Uh, well, I remember while I was at Princeton, we accepted a, they accepted a, a Japanese person as a graduate student and were amazed when she arrived and turned out to be a woman. <laughs> so unusual was that? Well, it was... Well, you didn't know the name was was a female name, but... Exactly. Well, no, Princeton was an all-male school at that time. It was all-male? Yeah. I so see. Was, so I think... She might not have been admitted had they known. I'm sure, surely not, yes, I think... So I think... Uh, well, I don't remember exactly what happened. I think they made the best of it. She eventually left for one reason or another, but it was much later that Princeton actually became a co-ed university. Oh. That makes me ask about your community. How similar are you all fundamentally? Are you relatively from uh, similar backgrounds? Uh, or is it really, aside from the question of gender and so forth, is it, and perhaps even ethnicity, uh, are people mostly just alike or is it that they speak a common language that is the uh they certainly don't seem alike to me they seem very different on the other hand uh well, the community of mathematicians has it's an international community we have perhaps more in common with each other than other people of our nationality uh political background is irrelevant uh, in terms of... Well, that's a very delicate question. <laughs> uh, we certainly can try to ignore politics when we're doing mathematics, but well, just in the matter of history, for example, it's, it's certainly a fact that there were some great mathematicians who were ardent Nazis, and uh, uh, I suppose this is well, we just have to be aware of it. We have to enjoy their mathematics and yet uh, not approve of their politics. Right. Yeah. It's not only in mathematics that people can have uncomfortable political positions and still contribute to the field. Yes. But it's also yours is the generation uh, of the Cold War. Yes. And how much is the Cold War relevant or irrelevant to the pursuit of mathematics at that time? Well, I think there was very little communication with Russia, so I remember often getting messages from Vladimir Arnold in, in Russia t telling me that, yes, what I was doing was very nice, but this or that Russian had already done it. Or <laughs> so it was, uh, well, it was a valuable cross-communication to, to, to compare approaches of different people. Uh, at the time. Now, of course, after 
more than half of the Russian mathematicians left Russia, the situation became very different. And they're, they're not scattered all over. We certainly have many here in Stony Brook. Did you, in fact, in, in uh, full throttle in your career, travel to the Soviet Union or they to you? Yes, I, I've certainly made several trips to the Soviet Union. Uh, it was uh, it was a little scary in a way. Uh, you know, people would not be willing to talk to me unless we were out in the park or somewhere. Where, really? Yeah. You you actually found that? Yes. So that's a dramatic example of the intrusion of the world. Yes. Is um. There's certain uh, students that you had, mm -hmm. you may say, no, it's, it, it's not true, but I'm interested, whose contact with you was more almost collegial, that they were, that their minds, their interests were so compatible with yours that in a way you were together discovering rather than teaching? Oh, I, that sounds like it should always be true. Uh, but a favorite students or ones whose uh, work um, fascinated you particularly? Well, I suppose my early student, Larry Siebenman, was the one who has made the biggest name for himself mm -hmm. and produced many students of his own. Uh, more recently, uh, well, I guess the two students I've been closest to have been Jan Kiwi from Chile and Saeed Zakari from Iran. But, uh, well, the mathematical communi community is a, can, can be a very close one. We, people from many different backgrounds can Yes. Oh, I understand. It was just yeah. an opportunity in case yeah. somebody particularly popped to mind. But. No. I suppose the person that I, I was closest to in recent years who was Adrien Deletti from France, who, who died in an unfortunate accident a few years ago. He was a very impetuous, lived life to the full, and was, uh, he died in, uh, in southern France, uh, enjoying himself by jumping off a cliff into the into the Mediterranean, where oh. he had a heart attack. Oh, oh. <laughs> if you were a mathematician today, where would you expect um, some of the exciting developments to be? I I feel that I'm no good as a predictor. I've uh, I've seen many changes in mathematics during my lifetime. They were all a surprise to me.